Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'm gonna be taking you on my journey to build the ultimate video editing PC. If I sound a bit husky, some might say sexier than usual, it's because I'm just getting over a head cold, but I couldn't wait any longer to get my new PC built. This video is split into three sections. First, I'm gonna take you through my thought process in choosing the components. Hopefully this will give you some ideas if you're thinking of building your own video editing rig. Next, we'll actually go and build the PC, and last, we'll go and install Windows and get it set up and see how it performs. Okay, so let me walk you through my thinking and why I chose the components I did. First of all, I needed to choose a CPU and a motherboard. At the moment, it's hard to beat the price performance that AMD can offer, so I decided not to go with an Intel processor. Now I knew I wanted an AMD, I had to choose between a Threadripper or non-Threadripper CPU. Depending on the video editing software you're using, it may or may not make good use of multiple cores. If your software isn't optimized for many cores, then the clock speed of the CPU is more important. It also depends on how good your software is of making use of a graphics card for hardware acceleration and rendering. To try and hit both a higher core count and a decent clock speed, I settled on the AMD Ryzen Threadripper 3960X. This is a 24 core CPU that has a base clock speed of 3.8 GHz with a single core max boost of up to 4.5 GHz. It also supports PCI Express version 4 which means potentially faster reads and writes from M2 SSDs if they're version 4 compatible. Stay tuned as later in the video we'll see if any of this makes a difference in performance. Now I'd chosen the CPU, I needed to choose a motherboard. One of the things I wanted in the motherboard was a built-in 10 gigabit ethernet port, as I'm gonna want to move a lot of data around to a NAS when I get one set up at some point in the future. This limited my choice in motherboard. I also wanted to have support for at least three M2 SSDs and also have support for PCI Express version four. Because of everything that's happening at the moment, some stock was hard to get hold of here in Australia. I eventually settled on the ASUS ROG Zenith 2 Extreme Alpha TRX40 motherboard. Next I had to choose some RAM, so I went to the ASUS website and checked what RAM is certified and if I could find it here in Australia. This took a bit of time, but eventually I found the G-Skill Ripjaws 128GB pack which has four 32GB sticks of 3200MHz DDR4 RAM. The motherboard actually supports up to 256GB of RAM and has eight slots, so it leaves some room for upgrading in the future. Next, I had to choose some storage. I knew I wanted M2 SSDs for the best performance and luckily, Samsung had just released their PCI Express 4 980 Pro SSDs. I chose to get three of these one terabyte drives, one for Windows and application installation, one as the primary project drive and one as a scratch proxy or media cache and Dropbox drive. This setup should split the workload between the three drives and with PCI Express 4, there'll hopefully be enough bandwidth for all of them. The Samsung 980 Pro supports up to 7,000 megabytes sequential read and up to 5,000 megabytes sequential write per second with 1.5 million hours MTBF and 600 terabytes written with a five-year warranty. The final major component was the choice of graphics card. This is where things got a bit frustrating as the new 3000 series Nvidia cards were just about to come out, so I decided to put off the build for a few weeks. Unfortunately, here in Australia, it was pretty much impossible to get hold of one of the more budget-friendly 3070s, and there was also no stock of 3080s. The only 3000 series card I could find was a Gigabyte GeForce RTX 39 Vision OC. This was way more expensive and way more than I wanted to spend on a card, but the only other cards in stock were 2000 series cards, such as the 2080 Ti. But I wanted to build a future-proof system, so I had to bite the bullet with the 3090. I want this PC to be my main rig for many, many years to come and be able to support 8K video and also After Effects work. In the long run, this will be a good choice of card, but it's painfully expensive at the moment. For the CPU cooler, I chose the Noctura NH-U14STR4 SP3 cooler and grabbed some Noctura NTH1 ProGrade Thermal Compound to attach it to the CPU. The power supply is the Be Quiet Straight Power 11 1000 Watt 80 Plus Platinum Modular Power Supply and the case is the Lianli Lancor 2 Mesh White E80X case. This seems to have got reasonable reviews for airflow through the case to keep everything cool. The case doesn't come with the USB port cable that's currently on its way to me, and there's also an extra uh, case LED strip, which I'm also waiting for, but I can add those in later. All right, let's go and build this thing.
So it's been about a week now since I finished the build and unfortunately got a bit sicker, but kind of getting a bit better now. Anyway, I thought we could have a look at the performance of the build now. We'll go and have a look at some different types of rendering. We'll render some 4K and some 8K. We'll also have a look in the timeline and see how responsive the scrubbing is in Premiere Pro. Okay, let's head into the computer. Let's start off with this 4K sequence. So I've split this up into three sections. The first section here with this marker is all footage shot with the Sony a7S III. This is 100 megabits per second, 10 bit 422 color. So usually HEVC or H.265 is quite hard to edit natively without proxies. So I've got the dropped frame indicator active here. And let's start off by playing this back. We're at full playback resolution here and we'll see if we drop any frames. So you can see that this is playing okay at the minute. The uh, drop frame indicator here is still staying green. Then we'll just leave this running for a few minutes just to see if we drop any frames. Sometimes you'll start playback and then everything will be fine but a few seconds or a minute in you'll start to get drop frames. So we'll just give it a chance. So we're coming up to a minute now, and as you can see here, we still don't have any drop frames, which is good. And notice down here that I've also got this adjustment layer. I've just got an instance of Lumetri working on this. So just to make this more realistic, I've added an adjustment layer with some color grading, just so you can see what the playback's like in a more realistic scenario when you've got some kind of effects going on. So now we're up to a minute and a half, still no drop frames. And I've tested this and this plays all the way through with zero drop frames, which is pretty good for H.265. Next up in this section, this is once again HEVC 422 10-bit color, but this is shot at 120p, again on the Sony a7S III, and the bitrate for this is 280 megabits a second, so pretty high. And each of these clips down here, I've slowed down to 20%. So let's try and play these clips back and see if we get any drop frames. So we're playing back 120p in a 24p timeline now. And as you can see from the dropped frame indicator here, we're not getting any drop frames. So this is playing back without any problems. And we could leave this going. But I've already tested this and you can play the whole way through with zero drop frames, even at 280 megabits a second, slowed down 20%. Let's just stop this. The final section here is once again the 128p at 280 megabits a second, 10 bit 422. And at the minute if we play this, you can see that there's no drop frames, everything's playing quite smoothly. If I, however, right click on this and come up to speed duration and we'll click this button to reverse the clip, just come back to the start of the clip and try and play again. Notice this time the drop frame indicator goes yellow, telling us we've dropped six frames already. So we're not getting smooth playback now. And if I have a look at the task manager down here, you can see that we're pretty much maxing out the CPU at 94%. So this is maxing out 24 cores just because we've reversed the clip playback. And you can also see down here that the GPU is only using about nine or 10, 5%, whereas the CPU is almost fully being used just from reversing the clip. So that's one situation where you probably have to use a proxy or something to make this a bit more usable. Okay, so that's playback. So let's take a look now at how smoothly things scrub in the timeline. So we'll start off with this 422 100 megabits a second at 24 frames a second. And what I'm gonna do, I'll just zoom in a little bit here. So I'm just gonna scrub forwards and backwards here. It's pretty smooth. It's occasionally a bit jerky. So let me try scroll quite smoothly here. Let's just find this bit. What I'll do, see a bit of jerkiness there. But it's pretty good. It's definitely usable. And you can always drop this down to half speed. Things get a lot smoother with the scrubbing there at half speed. Let's take a look at this 280 megabits 120p. 
I'll just set this back to full and I'll zoom in a little bit again. And this is pretty smooth. Bit of jerkiness there. See when I move back, we've got some jerkiness. So not completely smooth for scrubbing. Let's turn this down to half resolution. And that's so much better. Little bit of jerk there. So depending on what you're doing, scrubbing might not be quite as smooth as you want it to be. Again, a quarter playback, it's not too bad. But it's still usable at full screen, or full resolution, I should say. And finally, we'll look at this reversed footage. Try and scrub through this. This is at full resolution, it's very choppy. Yeah, very choppy at full resolution. If we drop this down to half, see how the scrubbing goes. Yeah, we've got quite choppy still, as you can see there. Drop this down to a quarter, see how we look. So remember that this is the reversed clip as well, so it's 280 megabits a second reversed and slowed down to 20%. So it's pretty usable at a quarter there, occasional bit of lag. But once again, you'd probably have to proxy this or pre-render it or do something. So that's 4K H265 and it's pretty damn usable even with some color grading. Let's take a look next at some 8K raw footage. Got this 8K demo sequence here. I've currently got this color grading adjustment layer disabled. Let's start off with some playback. I'm at full, full resolution there. Let's hit play. And this is red raw 8K. So you can see that's playing back really well with no drop frames. And I got this red raw footage from raw.film. This is free sample footage that you can download. As you can see, we're halfway through these different clips now and we've got zero drop frames. And if we have a look at Task Manager, we're only using about 7%, 1% CPU and very little GPU. And that's because the playback stopped, which doesn't help. So we're playing back this 8K raw footage. We're using about 55% CPU and about 28, 25% GPU. And you can see here we've dropped a couple of frames now. So in this entire one minute and nine seconds, we've only dropped one frame, which is not bad for 8K raw footage. And we're playing back at full resolution here, which actually doesn't make any sense if the program monitor window here is not full screen or not on an 8K screen. So you could easily drop this down to half, and if we play this back now, we probably won't see any drop frames. I'm just gonna set this back to full screen and we'll have a look at the scrubbing. Just scroll in a bit, find a clip with a bit more movement, maybe the drumming one. Scrubbing through the timeline here, it's pretty good, considering it's 8K raw footage, you're a bit jerky there. So it's not perfect. If we drop this down to half, see how this looks, yep, that's pretty good. Like I say, it doesn't make sense to use full resolution on 8K footage really, if we're just editing in this small program window. But that's pretty smooth, definitely usable. A little bit of jerkiness, but. I'm just gonna go and enable this adjustment layer which contains Lumetri effect. So we'll just enable this, see if this makes any difference. I'll set this back to full screen full resolution and you can see now that we're actually dropping some frames now we've got Lumetri enabled let's drop this down to half, res half resolution playback and at half resolution playback you can see that we've got no drop frames here Obviously, if you add more effects and more layers, you might get some slowdown. So, so far, so good. Uh, this PC is pretty much going to do everything I need it to do or want it to do. And I think it's going to be pretty future proof. The fact that you can edit 8K raw footage without any proxies uh, is pretty good. So in the future, even if things get a bit more complicated or perhaps 12K, 16K, 3 million K, then uh, it might become obsolete, but you can still use proxies. So that's the editing and scrubbing experience, which is pretty good. Let's take a look next at the rendering times. So what I'm gonna do is start off with this 8K sequence and we'll go and render this. 
I'm just going to come up to File, Export, and we're going to start off with this H.264 preset. I'm just going to leave match source bitrate, pretty much leave everything as it is, make sure we're exporting the entire sequence. And I'm just going to queue this up in Media Encoder. I'm also going to come back to Premiere Pro and queue up another export. This time I'm going to choose H.265. Just going to leave everything as the default. I didn't show you the last one, but this time we're using hardware encoding. So we'll queue that one up. And we're going to start off processing these two files. So I'm not going to wait around for these to finish. I'm going to fast forward to the future and then we'll see how we get on. So we're almost done now. And you can see in the second version that the GPU down here is at about 50 or 60%, whereas the CPU is only at 20%. In the first lot of encoding, where we were using software, there was hardly any GPU activity, and you can see in this section here, the video encode is doing most of the work. And we're also using about 10 gigs of the 24 gig GPU memory. Okay, that's the renders done. If we take a look at the times, so this is the first one where we're using software encoding. This is not a particularly scientific test as we've got slightly different bit rates. But you can see here the encoding time was 4 minutes and 57 seconds. And with the hardware encoding using H.265, we're at about 4 minutes and 5 seconds. So we saved off about 50 seconds by encoding to H.265. I'm going to close this down and I'm going to come back to our 4K sequence here. And what we'll do is we'll go and perform the same tests to render this sequence. We'll start off by rendering and we'll start off with H.264. And for fun, what I'm going to do is choose this YouTube 4K Ultra HD preset. And if I scroll down here, you can see that we've got this hardware encoding set up by default. This will use the GPU and we can set a bit rate here. Let's say choose something a little bit crazy, 18 megabits per second and we're still able to use hardware encoding here. So once again, I'm gonna queue this up and we'll also queue up a version that's going to use H.265. There wasn't a YouTube preset here. So I'm just gonna start off with the 4K UHD preset and come down here. Once again, we're using hardware encoding. And if I try and set this bit rate to 80, it's not gonna let us, it's gonna let us choose a maximum of 60, but let's just go all out and choose the highest quality once again, we'll queue that up and I'll go and kick off the rendering again and then I'll see you in a minute and we'll see how long these two took. So we're about halfway through encoding the H.264 version and quite interestingly over here in Task Manager you can see that we're using about 84% of the GPU and we're using about 34% of the CPU. That's just gone up to 54% now. So it's using an equal mix of GPU and CPU for this encoding. When we get nearer to the end of this encoding where we had the reversed footage, it's gonna be interesting to see what happens in the task manager. What we'll probably see is the GPU utilization drop and then the CPU kind of max out again when it comes to that reversed clip. So we'll just keep it running. And you can see now we're at the end of this clip and the CPU utilization has spiked up to like the 90s and the GPU utilization here has dropped down to almost nothing. And this is the section of the encoding where we're encoding that reversed footage, which is completely CPU bound. So Premiere Pro is not using any hardware acceleration to do that reversing of footage. You can see the GPU is flatlined here almost and the CPU is almost maxed out. In this situation, what I'd probably do is render that reverse section and then re-import that back into the project just to ease the burden on the computer a little bit. Okay, so we should be almost finished now. And I can see from the OLED screen inside the motherboard that the CPU temperature and CPU fan have really cranked up now. It's kind of expected. So now we're encoding the second version of that 4K sequence, this time using H.265. And you can see over here that the GPU is now being utilized pretty much 100% of the time and the CPU utilization has dropped to 52%. So we're really making the most of this beefy graphics card when we're encoding H.265. Remember that we're using much higher bit rates for these encodings than we were for the 8K as well. All right, we'll come back when that's finished. So that's the two 4K renders complete. Let's have a look at the stats. Let's come down here. 
So the first version that used hardware encoding but output H.264 took 10 minutes and 35 and the H.265 output took 11 minutes and 55 seconds. So not a huge amount in it. If we have a look at the file sizes, so the H.264 version is about 10.8 gigs and the H.265 version is about 8.1 gigs. So both files here are pretty darn big. That's because we used really crazy bit rates. But basically for that extra minute and a half encoding, we saved about two gigs-ish on file size output. Okay, for the last test, we're gonna have a look at Catalyst Browse, and I've already done a couple of videos on this, so be sure to check those out. Basically, it's the gyro stabilization post-production tool that you can use with the Sony A7S III and some other Sonys. So let's go and boot that up, and here we've got an unstabilized clip. I'm gonna come down here and choose Stabilize. It's gonna analyze the clip, and if we play these two back side by side, you can see one version is a lot smoother. The version on the right here is the gyro stabilized version. You should check out my other videos to learn more about this. Let's see how long this takes to render the stabilized version. I'm going to come down here and I'm going to choose the output 100 megabits per second to get a really big file once again and just choose export and we'll see how long this takes. You can see at the top here the progress and if we have a look at task manager once again we're using a bit of CPU and a bit of GPU, but it's not really maxing out either one. So we're not making full use of the system or um, Catalyst Browse isn't making full use of the system in this specific instance. You can see on the graphics card quite interestingly here that the GPU is mainly using the 3D hardware, not the video encode or decode. And that's probably because behind the scenes there's a lot of kind of 3D calculations in terms of the gyro stabilization going on. But at least it's using some of the GPU hardware, not just relying on the CPU. So let's just head back to Catalyst Browse here. And we can see that we've got about three minutes remaining. So I did have a comment on one of my other gyro stabilization videos asking about how fast this process is. And as you can see on pretty beefy hardware, it's still not the fastest thing to do this gyro stabilization process. So you might be better off just using something like Steady shot active during shooting rather than having to do this in post. So I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please click the thumbs up button. That really helps the channel. And also subscribe to the channel if you're not already doing so. If you've got any questions about the actual PC build or any suggestions that I can maybe be of some help for, make sure you leave a comment down below and I'll try and get back to as many comments as I can. See ya.